Kids are spending thousands of dollars on games. Would you play a story-driven Division spinoff? And we get more details on Ubisoft's Gods and Monsters. My name's Force. Welcome back to the Force feed. The shitty newsman! Number one gaming news channel on YouTube, especially now that my competition revealed their deepest, darkest secrets. Step aside, everybody. A new sheriff's in town. Uh... <laughs> What the f**k? I'm not a cowboy. First up today, we're gonna be talking a bit about microtransactions, video games, and kids. If you remember last week, we went into this uh, BBC story about uh, kids draining a family's bank account by opening card packs in FIFA. Well, since that article was posted, there's been a slew of new reports of basically similar situations. I wanna run through some of that stuff here. One of the main highlighted features was a adult who had a 22-year-old disabled son, and he said he had has recently been playing a game on his iPad called Hidden Artifacts, which involves finding various items and matching them to the description. He has been charged 3,160 pounds between the 18th of February and the 30th of May 2019, clearing out his entire savings. Now that wasn't the only story told, we had a few others. My 16 year old son spent nearly 2,000 pounds of my money on EA's NBA basketball game. He used my bank card and I didn't realize until I had a payment declined. Another parent says that their 15-year-old boy spent a thousand dollars on Fortnite. These stories of, of people and especially like underage people spending hundreds or thousands of dollars or, or pounds in this particular instance on these video games. It, again, it's not a new occurrence, but I think it's starting to get more and more into the limelight. And one of the main reasons might just be the huge popularity of games with in-app purchases amongst kids. Specifically, we could point to something like Fortnite. It's not not like this is the first time kids have been playing video games. Kids playing games has been a common thing for a very long time. But it really hasn't been until recently that games marketed towards and played by kids have had the potential to basically spend unlimited amounts of money. I mean, think about some of like the most popular kids games in the past. You look at something like Minecraft. Minecraft was a world phenomenon, even to this day still is, that's super popular amongst a young audience. But it isn't a game that you're gonna be accidentally spending thousands of dollars in. Unless things have changed recently, to my recollection, that doesn't really happen in a game like Minecraft. But since Minecraft, probably the next biggest game amongst kids has been Fortnite. A huge population of our children playing Fortnite, a game that you can spend easily hundreds and thousands of dollars on by mistake or on purpose or whatever the reason is, I think this issue is, is finally starting to be brought a lot more towards parents' attentions. Besides Fortnite, again, one of the games that people have grievances against are these sports games that have these trading packs. FIFA is an example that particularly comes up. So, so yes, this isn't a new issue of people spending lots of money on video games. But I think it's, again, it's being highlighted because we have these super popular games amongst a very young audience, combination between things like Fortnite and all of these mobile games and kids growing up and getting smartphones at younger and younger ages. You know, and I talked about this probably a lot more in depth in the last video than I will be in this video. The basic thing is you get a couple of points of failure here. First off, clearly the parents need to be monitoring what their kids are doing with their finances. Like how much access kids have access to, to banks, like bank accounts and credit cards or whatever. Parents have to be paying attention to this. But it is then also clearly on the side of these games developers and publishers who make these things even possible. I mean, after the last video, there was a lot of great discussion about it, but it was brought to my attention that think about how ridiculous it is that it's even possible possible to spend thousands of dollars on a video game. Really think about it. We could have the conversation about funding future development and all the yada 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 yada. Yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it. Microtransactions and DLCs as a way of like funding development for further adding to a game, I totally understand. But let's just, just the concept of the fact that you can spend thousands of dollars on a video game nowadays. When I was growing up, that wasn't even a possibility. And that might be another side to this coin. Maybe we do have parents who grew up with some familiarity to games. They played Mario 64, they played Cruise in USA, they played Metal Gear Solid, whatever. They didn't grow up in the age where you could spend thousands of dollars on video games. That hasn't been a thing until 
Whip at five, the, like like past five to seven years is when it's really become inc super popular. So yeah, between these big like AAA super popular mega hits like Fortnite and the prevalence of these apps and kids getting access to the stuff at a younger and younger age, and then just parents being negligent, frankly, and not knowing, not understanding how this stuff works, not realizing that when they put in their card information to buy that $4.99 app on the iPad for their kid to click on some bubbles or whatever, they didn't realize that it was saving that information, and then the kid clicked to get the hyper bubbles that made the gameplay even better. You know what? It's just crazy. It's pretty nutty, and there's a lot probably more nuanced of a conversation than you're gonna get here from this guy. At the end of the day, uh, there, there, there's a lot of parties at fault here, but people need to start working together to figure this stuff out because yeah, otherwise the governments are gonna start t stepping in and start regulating this stuff themselves. Next up in the news, would you play a single player story-driven spinoff of The Division? That's the question being raised apparently. Tim Spencer, level director at TT Games, tweeted out the following musings. I love the idea of a single player narrative-driven spinoff of The Division, focusing on an agent trying to get home to their family after being sent to New York City during the S. HD blackout and the fall of DC. Now in this post, he tagged Ubisoft's creative director, who then tweeted out the post to his followers asking what their thoughts were. And he actually seemed to get a fairly positive reception. Like there seemed to be a lot of good, just good reception to this idea of a single player story driven division spinoff. And I do think it's like a pretty cool universe that you could explore some great stories with. And it's, that was never the focus for me when I played the division games between the first one and the second one, given that they were like open world loot driven RPGs with levels and gear grinding and all that stuff. That was really my main focus. The general setting I always thought was really cool. I think especially the Division one, I absolutely adored this like broken down, snowed in winter New York City. I thought that was an amazing setting. I loved just playing in that space. And I think there probably are some really cool stories that you could tell in that setting in a single player driven game versus a games as a service game. I've talked about it a few times here. I love MMOs and I love loot games. and I, I really do like these games as service games. There's just too many of them asking for too much of my time. More condensed experiences that you play through the single player story for 20 hours and then you're done and you move on to something else. That stuff is getting more and more appealing to me as I'm kind of overwhelmed with all of these games that want me to play them every single day. And I can't possibly devote the amount of time that I would like to to all of them. So. I don't think it's a terrible idea, and it seems like there was some good feedback. I mean, all this is is just some discussion on Twitter. This doesn't mean that anything remotely close to this will be happening in the next five or ten years. I don't know, Ubisoft can make games pretty quick, right? <laughs> Maybe we will get this pretty soon. All right, last up in the news, speaking of Ubisoft, I wanna talk about some details that we got about their upcoming game, Gods and Monsters. Now, this thing was first revealed back at E3, and we really didn't have too much information other than this, like, bright and vibrant art style little one-minute teaser trailer. Well, we do have some more details now, thanks to a post on their official site. So, this is from the creators of Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and it's gonna be an adventure game, they say, about a forgotten hero on a quest to save Greek gods. The whole concept is we're gonna be exploring Exploring this fantasy world filled with trials and dungeons while fighting off these mythological creatures. It's going to be an open world game that mixes things like traversal, platforming, combat, puzzles, and then has resource management systems. It's said to have fast paced combat that takes place both on the ground and in the air. And it's going to be a full on RPG with character customization, stats, and skills, and gear that give you special abilities. Like they referenced the Boots of Hermes that give you the access to double jumping. Now, this game is actually coming out pretty soon. It's slated to launch in February on February 25th of 2020. So we're not really that far off. And at the moment, we got a couple screenshots from this post. And then we've got like that one minute trailer. But that's it. We haven't really seen much gameplay. We haven't ha heard much about the systems, which is kind of crazy to me, given that we are so close to launch. Too early to tell exactly what this is going to end up shaping up to be. But I am hopefully optimistic, maybe naively so. <laughs> and briefly, before we wrap up today, I want to talk about uh, this cool thing that's coming to Steam. It's called Steam Labs. These are basically experiments that Valve is running around game discoverability that you can sign up to try yourself. So there's three major focuses right now. There are these things called micro trailers, which are six second trailers for every game. They also have an interactive recommender that looks at how much you've played each game in your library. And then based off of that data, will recommend games to you. And then finally, they have this thing called the automatic show, which is a daily 
machine generated show about the latest games. Wait a second, wait a second. Robots are taking over my job? Don't sign up for this bullshit. Steam Labs, it sounds bad. I would avoid it at all costs. Oh, also, just as a little update, a little personal update, uh, I have started playing Final Fantasy XIV. So far, I gave some guards pretzels and saved a tiny princess, and then I fought this bat looking creature. I don't know, it seems pretty cool. Uh, as people pretty much unanimously agree, it seems like it's getting off to kind of a slow start, but I've, I've played for a few hours now, and I am overall enjoying it. I'm kind of approaching this game more slow and relaxed than I typically approach MMOs, and you know, I'm gonna keep on going. We'll see if I can make it past the 1 to 50, which is supposed to be like the worst part of Final Fantasy, and then get on to those later expansions leading up to Shadowbringer. As I've talked about before, I just love MMOs, and I want to fully experience this thing. So that's it for today's news. Thank you guys for checking out this video. Hope you enjoyed it. Again, I've got some of the special analytical behind the scenes details thanks to my competition and I'm gonna use that information to dominate the YouTube gaming scene. You made a big mistake, dude. <laughs>